Hello and welcome to my channel. Today we're looking at Wesley Ant Allen Dodd. Uh, he lived from 1961 to 1993. So he lived, he was almost uh, 32 years old. He was an American convicted serial killer and sex offender. He was executed by hanging in 1993. In 1989, he sexually assaulted and murdered three young boys in Vancouver, Washington. He was arrested later that year after a failed attempt to abduct a six-year-old boy at a movie theater. Dodd wrote detailed accounts of his murders in a diary that was found by police. After pleading guilty to the charges of murder, he received the death penalty. After refusing an automatic appeal, he was executed by hanging January 5, 1993, the first legal hanging in the United States since 1996. So, he was in the Washington State Pen Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. It says... Wesley Allen Dodd was born in Toppenish, Toppenish, Washington, on July 3rd, 1961, the oldest of Jim and Carol Dodd's three children. Dodd claimed he was never abused or neglected as a child, and you would have thought with the things he did, he would have had to have been sexually abused. He claimed, however, that the words, I love you, were never said to him as he grew up, nor could he even remember saying them. His younger brother Gregory was arrested in 2016 for the attempted sexual abuse of a 13-year-old girl. So you would think that they were abused, that they had to have been sexually abused, because even his younger brother was arrested for trying to sexually abuse someone. The Seattle Times reported that Dodd described a diary written during his imprisonment that his father was emotionally and physically abusive, that he was often neglected in favor of his younger siblings, and that he witnessed violent fights between his parents. At school, Dodd was not welcome into any social groups, leaving him with no friends. By the age of nine, Dodd had discovered that he was sexually attracted to other boys. By the age of nine, he had to have been sexually abused. There's no way. Um, on July 3rd, 1976, Dodd's 15th birthday, his father attempted suicide following an argument with his wife. He graduated from Richland High School in 1979. At the age of 13, Dodd began exposing himself to children in the neighborhood. Yeah, I would think he definitely had to have been sexually abused, even though he said he wasn't. I would think he was ashamed of that, but I don't know. His father eventually told an Oregon newspaper that he was aware of the behavior, but largely ignored it, since he felt his son was otherwise a well-behaved child who never had problems with drugs, drinking, or smoking. By the time he entered high school, Dodd had progressed to child molestation, beginning with his younger cousins and then neighborhood children he offered to babysit, as well as the children of a woman his father was dating. Yeah, you would think he was definitely sexually abused by someone. At the age of 15, Dodd was arrested for indecent exposure, but police released him with a recommendation of juvenile counseling. In August 1981, at the age of 20, Dodd tried to abduct two girls who reported him to the police. No action was taken. They didn't do anything to him. The following month, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy and was assigned to the submarine base in Bangor, Washington, where he began abusing children who lived on the base. Once Dodd offered a group of boys $50 to accompany him to a motel room for a game of strip poker. This time he was arrested. Despite confessing to the police that he planned to molest the boys, he was released with no charges filed. Once again, nothing happened to him. Shortly afterwards, he was arrested again for exposing himself to a boy 
and was dishonorably discharged from the Navy. Dodd spent 19 days in jail and underwent court-ordered counseling. In May 1984, he was arrested for molesting a 10-year-old boy, but received only a suspended sentence. He molested a 10-year-old, after, and that's so he's doing numerous things, and nothing's happening to him. Dodd planned his entire life around easy access to targets, as he referred to children. He moved into an apartment block that housed families with children and worked at fast food restaurants as a charity truck driver and other such jobs. He repeatedly molested preschool-aged children in his neighborhood, but the woman Oh, the preschool age children. It says children, like more than one child, but then it says woman, like singular, declined to press charges, fearing the experience would be too traumatic for her children. So maybe it was one parent and more than one preschool age child. In 1987, Dodd tried to lure a young boy into a vacant building, but the boy refused to go with him and instead told the police. Prosecutors were aware of Dodd's history of sexual offenses and recommended five years in prison. However, once again, Dodd received minimal punishment because he had not actually touched the boy or exposed himself. He was placed on probation in order to seek psychiatric treatment. After finishing probation, he stopped going to treatment and moved to Vancouver, Washington, where he was hired as a shipping clerk. In the early autumn of 1989, Dodd decided that David Douglas Park in Vancouver, a large, heavily wooded park with several secluded trails, would be a good place to find potential victims. He was arrested several times over the next few years for child molestation. Several times he was arrested. I don't know how many times he didn't get arrested, but he was arrested several times, each time serving very short jail sentences and being given court-mandated therapy. So he's just keeping doing it and doing it, and they're not giving him much time. All his victims, around 50 in all, 50 victims that he got caught for. I wonder how many he didn't. They were all below the age of 12, some of them as young as two, and most of them were boys. 50 victims that came forward and told on him. Dodd's sexual fantasies became increasingly violent over the years. He should have been locked up forever by now. He would later say, the more I thought about it, the more exciting the idea of murder sounded. I planned many ways to kill a boy. A psychiatrist who evaluated Dodd follow, following one of his convictions said that he fit the legal criteria for a sexual psychopath. By now, he should have been locked up. He should have been locked up. He shouldn't be out. So now he's going to commit murder. And he should have already been locked up because... He's got, well, he's got over 50 victims, and that's after all the other things he's already done with the other victims. And that's the ones that came forward, so there could be a hundred of them. On September 4th, 1989, Dodd went to Vancouver's David Douglas Park with a fish fillet knife and shoelaces and sought out young boys to kill. He lured two brothers, 11 and 10-year-old Cole and William Near, to a secluded area where he forced them to undress, tied them to a tree, and performed sex acts on them both. When he was done, he stabbed them repeatedly with a knife and fled the scene. The boys were soon discovered in the park. Cole was dead while William died en route to a nearby hospital. So now he's committed murder after all these things that he's done that he should have been locked up forever. Now he's committing murder. 
After the boys of the two brothers, Dodd started a scrapbook with newspaper clippings and other facts about the murders. On October 29th, Dodd drove to Portland, Oregon, where he encountered a four-year-old, a four-year-old, Lee Iselli and his nine-year-old brother, Justin, at a local park. And forgive me if I'm not pronouncing the last name right. The younger boy was playing alone on a slide, and Dodd succeeded in convincing the boy to come with him. Justin had gone home, so Dodd told Lee that he would drive him back to his house. He managed to take Lee to his apartment in Vancouver, apparently unnoticed, and he ordered him to undress. Dodd then tied Lee to his bed and molested him, taking photographs of the abuse. Dodd kept Lee overnight while he continued to sexually abuse him, all the while jotting down every detail in his diary. The next morning, he strangled Lee to death with a rope and hung his body in the closet, photographing it as a Maccabee trophy. He would later confess to police that he had originally planned not to kill the boy, but eventually decided that it was necessary to keep him from telling anyone. But he's been planning on killing people. Dodd stuffed Lee's nude body in trash bags and threw it in some bushes near Vancouver Lake. He burned Lee's clothing in a trash barrel except for the boy's underwear, which he kept as a souvenir of the crime. One day later, Lee's body was discovered, which sparked a manhunt for the killer. So then while they've got the manhunt, he's staying in his home. He's not going out. It says Dodd kept a low prowl profile and he mostly stayed in his apartment writing down future plans for child abduction and he built a homemade torture rack for his next victim a homemade torture rack what the and this is after all these crimes he's committed he should have been locked up if he would have been locked up he never would have committed the murders The system really failed that child and that child's mother, I'm telling you. On November 13, 1989, Dodd drove to Camus or Camus, Washington, around 12 miles east of Vancouver, where he attempted to abduct six year old James Kirk II from the restroom of New Liberty Theater. The child began fighting and crying as Dodd was leaving the theater. through the lobby, carrying the boy in his arms. Despite Dodd's attempts to calm the boy, theater employees became suspicious and followed Dodd out to the street. Due to their pursuit, Dodd released his victim, got into his car, and drove away. The boyfriend of the boy's mother, William Ray Graves, came to the theater lobby and was told that the boy had nearly been abducted. Graves went outside the theater in the direction where Dodd was last seen. Dodd's car had broken down a short distance away from the theater, and he was attempting to start the motor. In order not to raise Dodd's suspicion and to stall for times, Graves pretended to be a passerby and offered to help him. He then put Dodd into a headlock and returned him to the theater where employees called the police. The local police contacted the Portland Police Task Force investigating the kidnapping and murder of Lee Izelli. Forgive me if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Dodd was taken to the Camus, Camus Police Station, where Portland Task Force lead detective C.W. Jensen and Dave Trimble interviewed him. He was then taken to the Clark County Jail in Vancouver, where Jensen and Trimble Trimble continued their interrogation over the course of three days. Eventually, eventually, Dodd confessed to all three murders. Jensen and Trimble then served a search warrant at Dodd's home in Vancouver. During the search of Dodd's home, police discovered a homemade torture rack, along with the newspaper clippings about his crimes, a briefcase containing Lee Izelli's underwear, a photo album containing pictures of Lee Izelli and assorted photographs 
of children in newspaper and store catalog underwear advertisements. They also discovered Dodd's diary in which he wrote in detail about the murders. Dodd was charged with aggravated first-degree murder in the deaths of the near brothers and Lee Izzelli plus attempted kidnapping of another child. He initially pleaded not guilty to all charges but later changed his plea to guilty. During his trial, prosecution read aloud excerpts of Dodd's diary and displayed photographs of Lee Izzelli. The defense did not call any witnesses or present any evidence, suggesting only that Dodd must be legally insane. The jury found him guilty, prosecutors requested the death penalty, and the jury agreed. Dodd would claim that speaking in his own defense was pointless and ultimately the system had failed repeatedly. <clears throat> had failed repeatedly, but probably not in the way that he was referring to. Washington state law gave Dodd the choice of execution by lethal injection or by hanging. Dodd stated that he wished to die by hanging because that was how he killed Lee Izzelli, his last victim. In 1990, Dodd was sentenced to death for the murder of the Near Brothers, as well as for the separate rape and murder of Lee Izzelli. And please forgive me if I'm pronouncing anything wrong. Less than four years elapsed between the murders and his execution. He refused to appeal his case or the capital sentence. He insisted that he could not control his urges and would kill again, stating in one court brief, I must be executed before I have an opportunity to escape or kill someone else. If I do escape, I promise you I will kill and rape again and I will enjoy every minute of it. He also said in some interviews that death would give him relief from guilt over the murders. During his trial, he wrote a pamphlet on how parents could protect children from child molesters such as himself. Wow, there's something. One thing he, good that he did in between all the bad things he did was write a pamphlet on how parents could protect their children. Dodd's execution by hanging was the first in the United States since George York and James Lathan were hanged in Kansas in 1965. The execution was witnessed by 12 members of local and regional media, prison officials, family members of the three victims. Dodd ordered broiled salmon and fried potatoes for his last meal. His last words spoken from the second floor of the indoor gallows were recorded by the media witnesses as, I was once asked by somebody, I don't remember who, if there was any way sex offenders could be stopped. I said no, I was wrong. I was wrong when I said there was no way. I was wrong when I said there was no hope, no peace. There is hope, there is peace. I found both in Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the Lord and you will find peace. Dodd was executed at 12.05 a.m. on January 5, 1993 at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. He was pronounced dead by the prison doctor and his body was transported to Seattle for autopsy. Uh, the medical examiner, Ronald Ray, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right or not, found that Dodd had died quickly within two or three minutes. Is that quickly? That's like forever when you're dying though not from a broken neck, which is usual cause of death from hanging. He stated that Dodd's death had likely not been very painful. Within two or three minutes, Dodd was cremated following the autopsy as and his ashes turned over to his family. Dodd's execution came with some controversy over his choice of execution by hanging. Um, American... ACLU filed a lawsuit saying this method was a violation of the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution. The lawsuit made it all the way to the Supreme Court, but was unsuccessful in blocking Dodd's execution largely because Dodd himself chose hanging. On the day of the execution, many people gathered outside the prison, either supporting or protesting the execution. There was much media attention. Some TV news reports featured stories on the history of hanging, showing such thing as the loud sound that the 
trap door can make along with the silence that follows it and the type of rope that was going to be used and how to properly prepare for an optimum effect. Dodd's profile was featured along with another convicted sexual predator imprisoned in Washington in the 1992 Frontline episode Monsters Among Us. Dodd's crimes are included in the Investigation Discovery series Real Detective. In the episode titled Malice Detective, C.W. Jensen describes his involvement in bringing Dodd to justice and the effect it had on him personally. Dodd was the basis for an unseen character, a child killer named Wayne Dodds, in the 2002 film Insomnia, starring Al Pacino. He was fictionalized as a man who murdered a young boy in a similar, in a way similar to Dodd's murder to Lee Izelli. Several books have been written about the case, including When the Monster Comes Out of the Closet by Lori Steinhorst, who communicated with Dodd in writing and by phone almost daily for 18 months prior to his execution. Wow. Driven to kill by true crime author Gary C. King and Dr. Ron Turco's book about his experience during the initial investigation to assist in developing a profile of the killer. And then it gives all these references. But wow, look at all that's, it's horrendous because of all the different things he did at the beginning and they could have, and they knew, they knew at the beginning that he was doing all these bad things and he should have been, he should have been locked up. He should have, he should have been punished for all these different things that he did long before he had the 50 victims that he had molested, you know? The 50 victims right here, around 50 in all, that he had molested before the 50, he should have been locked up, right? And then he's got 50 victims, 50 victims. And in between all of this, he's not in prison forever, and he goes around committing murder. That's just horrific to me. That's just horrific. So, yeah. And I, I don't, you know, you imagine that he must have suffered greatly as a child because he's, he's doing bad things by the time he's nine years old. And then by the, you know, so, yeah. Anyway. There's one killer and... I'm going to do some videos on killers, but yeah, that's just horrific. Anyway, prayers for all of them, all of his victims, all of them. And you've just got to stop and, well, please stop and pray for all of his victims and their families and their loved ones. Because you got to think that when someone is sexually abused, they might grow up to become someone who sexually abuses someone else. So he's got all these victims, all of them. There's over 50, because he's got the 50, that could end up growing up and sexually abusing someone else. And what kind of life did they live? And how did it affect them? And how did it affect their children and their loved ones? So we should stop and pray for all of these people and everything that happened. So, and thank you so much for tuning in and have a great day. Bye-bye.